Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Paresh Shah I'm from Winnipeg, Canada. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to this webinar. Um, I think there's a broad range. We'll have some dentists and expanded functions, dental assistants as well. So, uh, kind of looking forward to it. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, there, a brief bio was just given. Uh, just want to tell you a couple of things about myself. One, uh, for those of you that are wondering, Winnipeg, Canada, I'm right in the heart of Canada, uh, geographic center. So if you look at Canada, we're right above Minnesota and North Dakota. So we're in the prairies. Yes, it's cold in the winter and it's nice and hot in the summer. So it's a great place to live and it's a great place to practice dentistry. Um, for those of you that are wondering um, if I, if you can, how I might be able to relate to all of you, I, I'm in private practice and general practice. I've been uh, in practice for 24 years and I'm a solo practitioner. I have three full-time hygienists. I work in a, an office. My office has five chairs. I have two and my hygienists have three. So it's a busy everyday practice. And although uh, one of the things that I really enjoy doing is more complex work, uh, my bread and butter is still doing everyday restorative composites and uh, crown and bridge. And so uh, temporaries or provisionalization is an important part of the practice. And some of it I do in my practice, some of it I delegate to my dental assistants wherever they're capable, wherever they're allowed to do, whatever portions of the procedure they're allowed to do in our jurisdiction. And uh, so we work together on that. And to have an efficient practice, uh, you, you know, all the different procedures have to be streamlined and, uh, and consistent and predictable. So I'm hoping that I could share with you some of the tips that we, uh, we use for uh, when we're doing our crown and bridge and especially the, the provisionalization portions of it. So uh, I'll, I'm going to walk you through a series of slides just on some theoretical aspects and little tips that we use. And then I'm going to end off the last half where we're just going to go through about seven or eight clinical cases. And you'll get a chance to uh, follow that and see some of the procedures. Okay. So uh, when we're talking about, uh, you know, I'm going to use the term interchangeable, whether it's going to be uh, a provisional or a temporary. It's, I'm referring to the same thing. And I tend to change that uh, nomenclature a bit. Uh, when we're talking about a definitive, like a final restoration, in order to have success, you know, I believe that it's important to, to have a successful and functional uh, provisional. The provisional is key to re restoring any prosthodontic or aesthetic uh, and functional uh, result. And, you know, nowadays we're counting on some of these uh, provisionals. If we're not doing uh, a, a same day or one appointment, restoration, we're counting on them sometimes needing to be in place for for months or even sometimes years if we're dealing with uh, with implants. So it's important to have a good material be done well and uh, and have something that's durable. So what are some of the functions of provisionals? Well, they provide comfort and function, obviously. Uh, they're there to improve aesthetics during the treatment. They're also useful in preserving periodontal health, tissue health, health uh, preventing uh, movement of, of teeth, like shifting and drifting of teeth, especially if you've got bridge work, um, and obviously from sensitivity and protecting the pulp. Um, we also use them for diagnostic purposes to help assess patients' home care during uh, certain treatments, especially more complex treatments that you're staging. Uh, helping to evaluate occlusal function and phonetics like speech and also vertical dimension if we're dealing with, you know, a quadrant, full arch or, or uh, full mouth rehabilitation. Uh, we can use them as a matrix to try and hold a dressing in place. Uh, for instance, I had uh, just recently done uh, uh, an extraction and I ended up doing a, a bone graft and socket preservation. So uh, my provisional, even though I placed sutures and a a membrane, but the uh, the provisional kind of helped hold everything in place because I bonded it in. Um, can use it to provide anchorage for orthodontics. In the same situation, just um, just this week, uh, my orthodontist asked me to fabricate some nice full contoured uh, uh, provisionals because the uh, the original crowns on on this particular patient were uh, were bulky and not 
of proper shape and proportion. So by putting in proper anatomical forms, he's able to now put brackets on there and move the teeth the right way. So they certainly uh, certainly help. And and then you start opening your broadening your horizons in terms of how you can use provisionals. We want to be sure some of the desirable features. We want to be sure that it's strong and durable. I'd mentioned that earlier. Must last at least through the term of the treatment. Uh, you want to, You just don't want to have breakage. I, I I get that as well, and it's very frustrating. It costs us money, and it's a it's a huge inconvenience to the patients, not just our staff. We want to have margins and occlusal relationships that are maintained as well. So we don't want to have big alterations of them. Um, desirable features as well, aesthetics. We want something that's acceptable, color stable, and maybe have some translucency for some of those anterior regions. And I'm going to be sharing with you um, a product that uh, that I'm going to be highlighting uh, as we as we move ahead move ahead today um, from one of uh, one of the products that I use a fair amount in my practice. And I'm really happy with so. I'll, I'll talk about perfect temp in a little bit. Uh, we want something that's biocompatible, something that doesn't irritate tissues, doesn't irritate the pulp, and when it sets, it doesn't uh, produce a lot of uh, heat or any heat at all. So that would be a nice thing also. Uh, some of the key features, of uh, the purposes of having a provisional, one is for actually uh, maintaining space. You want to be sure that you maintain space so that when you don't have uh, drifting, you want to be sure that the, the proximal contacts are maintained so when you go back and place your final crown that you have little to no adjusting afterwards, which would be very nice. The laboratory will be able to just reproduce it and you should be able to drop it in there. Uh, that would be a nice thing. You want to maintain occlusal contacts, the same thing. If you have a provisional here and this is the tooth that you're preparing, you, and if you don't put a provisional and you leave it for a week or two, well, yeah, this particular tooth above it will drift downward. The other teeth can tip a little bit, and all of a sudden you have to adjust your not only your contacts, but you might have to adjust the occlusion. It's a bit of an inconvenience again. Patients don't like it, and you, now you're starting to play around with the surface of the crown or, or uh, actually a natural tooth. Um, you want to have a nice smooth polish and that allows good tissue and gingival health. Res also resistant to, uh, to plaque formation. As soon as you have that and you got bleeding and you're trying to bond a crown in, you're going to have challenges. Emergence profiles are important too to deflect food away from the tissue and make sure it's not, it doesn't create any harm during the time that, uh, that the healing process takes place. So those are key things. We want to have a nice marginal seal, again, to prevent sensitivity, uh, protect the pulp, protect gingival irritation. So if you have a really bulky crown, that's not going to be a good thing because it's not going to promote good gingival healing. You'll get a lot of inflammation. If you have something that's over contoured, like on this side right here, that also is not a good thing because now you have a big overhang under there and you'll get plaque buildup under and it could cause especially with some long-term uh, provisionals and even working with implants, uh, you could end up having some recession. And that is not a good situation in areas of, of this high aesthetics. What are our options for uh, materials when we're doing provisionals? Well, we have a number of options that are available. And uh, I'm just going to go historically and talk a little bit about some of them. The, the original ones, one of them is uh, a methyl methacrylate, or MMAs. Uh, a lot of you would know biotamps or, or jet, jet acrylic, and we use that in dental school. Uh, it's easy to create good marginal adaptation. It's easy to, create, you know, for, to polish, and it's very inexpensive. The downside is they're not very strong. They create a lot of heat when they're setting, and their wear resistance isn't good. They really smell also, to be honest with you. Patients do not like that because you're mixing this powder and liquid. Uh, with um, with the, the, the other type is called the ethyl methacrylates or EMA. So one of the, a couple of the examples are, uh, are SNAP and TRIM. Those are the brand names. Um, they have a very low uh, exothermic reaction so they don't generate as much heat. They're easy to polish and they're a little tougher than the, than the MMAs. But it's still not long-term strength. So if you're doing large bridges and you want uh, 
or even bridge work and you want to keep it for a long period of time, it's not great. So the, the wear resistance isn't, isn't as, as good. Um, then our, so the summary with, with just the acrylics that we're used to, the, the advantages are, as I said, they're inexpensive, they're quick to use, you can repair them, uh, you still need a matrix, uh, and you have a variety of shades, but you, it's a powder liquid, it's a time-consuming process, it's a messy pro process, and they're not very strong. And they also, gener most of them generate a fair amount of heat. And, and of course, an odor and a taste are not very good. Uh, there are, for those of you that are doing chair side, there are now CAD CAM options. For instance, uh, uh, the Telio CAD is a product, uh, a block that's available for, uh, for the CAD CAM machines. Uh, I have an E4D, it's also available for CEREC. And uh, where you can actually, it's a polymethyl methacrylate block, so you can actually mill it and create a long-term provisional, whether it's a short bridge or it's an individual crown. So there are, those are options. Then we can move to indirect provisionals, and these are ones that are fabricated by the labs. Uh, some of the examples on the right side, you've got the uh, Resista, Ameri, and Biotemps, which is a Glidewell product. Uh, the advantage is it takes a little more, the downside is it takes a little more time, but they tend to be accurate because you've got a you've got an impression and the lab can actually do this outside the mouth it's less technique sensitive in addition but uh, it creates some extra work for the pay for the dentist because now you're gonna have to reline it and uh, and it certainly adds to the cost but sometimes I will use some of these types of provisionals if I'm really needing the time and the delicacy to create some really nice temps um, by my lab, and I've got you know a mounted case with, which is a little bit more complex. It certainly comes in handy. So we've discussed some of the chair side, we've, a, a chair side option, some of the traditional uh, or uh, um, chair sorry chair side options, a lab option, as well as um, a CAD CAM option. One of the most common types and most convenient types of uh, provisional or temporary materials that are available today in our practice are the bisacrylic uh, materials. These are the ones that come out of a gun. Most of our crown and bridge pace, cases for short-term use, uh, whether it's a day or a few weeks, you can use these. They, uh, the, the advantages are that they're, they're, it's easy to use, they have marginal adaptations great, they've got much better wear resistance than they used to have, uh, low shrinkage. Uh, they don't. Uh, they don't really expand too much. There's a slight amount during the set, and I'll explain the implications that that can have uh, when I go through some of the clinical cases. But uh, they, they're quite aesthetic as well, so that's a good thing. Now, traditionally, I put disadvantages in quotations because these were some of the complaints that were that that arise from people talking about uh, the bisacrils. Well, first of all, I mean, there is a, a cost issue, but some of the newer products, um, the, the prices are starting to come down. But I think just by using them and the, the benefits far outweigh the costs, and I'll explain to you and you'll see why. Um, but they talk about them being brittle, difficult to alter or repair, not very polishable, poor stain resistance. And you will see from some of the cases I'm going to show you, the products that, uh, that I use, that uh, these don't really um, hold water. I mean, the brittleness, yeah, there are some issues with that when you start getting into multiple pontics or, or extended provisionals where you don't have a lot of support, but then you're going to do a few other things to, to help the success of those provisionals. Um, so are these disadvantages, you know, the same now as they were maybe five, ten years ago? No, they're not. I, I do believe that the majority of them are a thing of the past. Um, so the, the, the advantages are they're auto mix. They don't generate a lot of heat, very minimal shrinkage, and you can get great aesthetics. And you can do them quite fast. But another big one is that you can actually bond composite to it. So it's really nice. In the past, uh, you had to get another, you had to take another tip and to add to it, or you'd have to use a repair kit that some of them used to have. And it was just an inconvenience. It was very expensive. So that was, uh, that was not very good. Um, what are the disadvantages? Well, yeah, they are more expensive than the acrylics, but I'll show you clearly that there are huge advantages of using the bisacrylics in terms of aesthetics and convenience. So that's a nice thing. 
matrices. When we're fabricating these, you, you need to have a, a good matrix. And ideally, if it's more of a complex case, you want to have a diagnostic wax up from the lab. And the matrix can be an alginet. It can be a pretreatment uh, impression of the tooth before you, uh, that you're maybe going to work on to do a crown. It's got a large alloy, and you want to, uh, you want to just take an impression of it. You can also use polyvinyl as an impression or an alginate uh, alternative or substitute. Is, and uh, you can also get a vacuum acrylic or a suck down stent that you can either make if you have a vacuum former or, or get a lab to do that as well. So, but you need to have some sort of a matrix to put the material in afterwards. Now, if you have a fractured tooth, let's say you're working on a, on a molar and one cusp is gone and you're going to be prepping it. Uh, what I typically will do, either myself or my assistant, is we'll dry that area off. We'll put um, a little bit of composite directly on there without any bond adhesive or anything, and then just just quickly sculpt it and cure it. I mean, it should take you all of 30 seconds or a minute to do. And now you've got a general shape and contour, and then you can make your template. And that way, there's less uh, fiddling around when you when you make your, your provisional. Um, how to create nice temporaries. You need a nice matrix that's contoured, and that's why I was mentioning that. So if you don't have a diagnostic wax up and you're treated a fractured cusp, just do a mock-up in the mouth. Make sure that the matrix is properly seated and doesn't rock. That's important. If, you, if you're sitting on tissue, make sure that it's on tooth, if you have teeth around there. Because if you put it on tissue, and let's say the person's moving their lip, when you go back in and put it in, how do you know that it's in the right position? Has it tipped one way or the other? Is it seated all the way down? Then you're just going to end up spending all this extra time either trimming back um, a bulky provisional or having to build it up because it's out of occlusion and or has an open contact. So important to just create a nice, have a nice template. Working time. Is it really important? Well, working time exists for a reason. It's best to work with those parameters because you've optimized the, can, the, the parameters and the working conditions that the material has been uh, designed for. Okay? If you remove a temporary too quickly, you can lead to inaccuracies, voids, pulls, uh, poor aesthetics as well. Uh, if you leave the temporary too long, it can get locked in. And there is a slight amount, not as much as in the past, but there's a slight amount of expansion as it's setting. Not heat, but just some expansion. So if you leave it a little too long past the, the working time, uh, then you might get it locked in. And then you're trying to take it out, and if there's a little undercut, it'll crack, and then you've got to start over. Uh, quite often, you'll have to have minimal or no adjusting if you follow the time. So that's a good thing. How do you prevent the temporaries from getting locked in? Well, evaluate the preparation in the adjacent teeth for any undercuts. You know, take your mirror, look on the sides. Uh, I use a, a buckle mirror that for photography a lot of times if it's in the, in the posterior, just to take a peek at it and see if there are any undercuts. Prepare, uh, you can still prepare the temporary depending on the size of the undercut, but remove it after the initial set to minimize uh, its expansion and getting it locked in. If it continues to get locked in, then you might have to revisit your preparation and make an alteration to it. Because otherwise you're going to end up having a challenge fitting your final restoration, or you might end up having uh, a big uh, food trap with that final restoration if you compromise that. So, um, once the initial set time is reached, typically, like, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about Perfect Temp 10, and that set the initial set time is about a minute and 30 seconds. A lot of the BIS GMAs are anywhere from about a minute and 10 to a minute and 30 seconds. So you place it in the mouth and after that period of time you take it out. Then I would try and reseed it a couple of times just to make sure it doesn't bind. If, it, if there's adjustment needs to be done, I usually will place the provisional back into the matrix and then trim the excess. It allows the temp to actually maintain its shape because sometimes if I'm holding it in my hand for that two or three minutes until it's fully set, it still has, it sometimes alters its shape just a slight amount. And again, the materials that are available now, it's just less and less inaccuracy, so it, they have been getting better. Um, when we're doing multiple units like veneers, I usually create one piece, and I will show you a clinical, a couple of clinical examples of uh, veneer provisionals. And I use what's called a shrink wrap technique. Uh, occasionally I'll spot bond them, but I'll show you that uh, shortly. Patient care, uh, what do we tell them? Well, I basically will, I mean, our usual oral hygiene needs to be optimal. 
Uh, when flossing, I'll typically we, we will tell them to pull the floss through the interproximal and not up and down through the contact, just during the provisional stage. Of course, avoiding hard and sticky foods. And if provisional is not uh, seated and cemented properly, they could leak. So if that happens, I'll tell them to avoid things like red wine, marinara sauce, uh, grape juice, things like that. They could stain them underneath. I made that mistake once years ago with some veneer provisionals and didn't do a great job of uh, sealing it. Ended up having some red wine and it doesn't look very nice, I'll tell you that. So with cements, what kind of cements do we have as options? You'll Basically, you'll have a clear cement and you'll have an opaque cement, but there are a lot of temporary cements that are available. And I usually will use a clear cement in the aesthetic zone. Uh, they Just keep in mind that if they're really worried about aesthetics, you know, just the, the color and the light activating in, activation in there will create just a little bit more uh, of a yellower, darker hue. Um, I think I wrote down do, but it's hue. And temp on or next temp or a couple of, uh, you know, other uh, products that are available. There's temp on, temp on clear. There are a number of other products I'm, I, I know. I, these are the ones that I just use in my practice. I'm not saying that the other ones are not not good. It's just you can only have so many. So there are a few uh, temporary resin cements that are also available by different companies. So Now, we do have some new um, BIS GMA temporary materials. And uh, one of them is called uh, Perfect Temp Tem. I used to use the original version for a long time. It was a good product. But uh, it had, uh, you know, it just like some of the uh, its contemporaries had a few of the... Uh, the disadvantages that I put put in earlier, but now they've really revolutionized things. Denmat's done a wonderful job of improving the the features of the product. So first of all, in terms of shades, you've got five good shades that will cover most of your aesthetic ranges for a temporary. I mean, if you really need to get more detail than this, then you're probably going to go to a lab, and uh, and it's certainly going to cost the patient a lot more. It's going to take you a lot more time. But for everyday dentistry and everyday crown and bridge for a short period of time, uh, these shades really do cover uh, the right spectrum for the, the aesthetic zone, including uh, a bleach shade as well. Um, set times. Uh, as I would mentioned, here's the key. When you start using this product, just like most others, you want to get going and get it placed in the mouth uh, within that 40 seconds. After that's done, from the time you start to the time you take it out of the mouth, I typically give it about a minute and 30 seconds, then I take it out. And my assistants do the same when they're making it. And then there's a just kind of a gelling or curing stage, and it's going to take about four and a half minutes. But you can work on it in that one and a half minutes to four and a half minutes time and get it all refined and polished. So those are, uh, those are good things. And I'll show you the clinical cases shortly. I will get to that, I promise. Um, what are some of the advantages of this particular product? Well, it's got a small filler particle size, so it allows you to actually get a nice luster and, and glossy surface. That means it's less uh, plaque retentive. Uh, you don't have a lot of polishing to do if you do uh, if you handle the material well and you let it set properly. But if you need, you can either just buff it with some discs. Uh, any of your favorite polishers, and they'll work really well. Um, it, it's, it's just, it, it does have a nice, nice finish, and it's, as soon as it's finished well, it's so much easier to, to limit the amount of plaque that'll build up and stain that'll build up on a, uh, on a tooth. This particular set of slides is, is not mine, uh, but the, all the other ones are. And, uh, but essentially, uh, on the right, what we've got here is a little template, and we're placing the material right inside it. It's seated in the mouth, and then uh, that was a pre-op template, and this is the kind of provisional that you can expect to, to get from uh, using Perfect Temp. And uh, as I said, the shades are there. It's good uh, working time, delivery method. You've, you've got either an, a 10 mil auto mix, or you've got the big 50 mil cartridges, and you've got a good shelf life, so you're not going to have it uh, go to waste. It really does have reasonable strength. It's got 120 meg megapascals of flexural strength, and the compressive strength is is quite impressive because it's 400 megapascals. So it's fairly strong. So 
I'm very confident that I can use it on a, on a molar for provisional and have it there for several weeks without it uh, breaking as long as I'm not keeping it super thin, but, but that goes with most of them. Um, once again, this is a summary of all of them. It's got great handling. One of the interesting features is, is that it doesn't have, uh, doesn't build up this oxygen inhibited layer, so you can actually get a nice polish and finish right away, uh, which is, uh, which is very nice. Now we're going to go into the clinical cases, and I've got a variety of them. So when we're taking provisionals, this is an example of a uh, an alginate substitute. I can't remember the name of it. I think it's Alginex, uh, but there are a variety of them that are available. And so we'll actually this this picture is of the provisional material just being removed after it had been seated in the mouth, and you get some flash around the edges. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take it out after it's set and trim the edges all around there. Okay, So that's the flash everywhere that you can see. And then take it out and I'll actually polish it up. And you'll see that I've used different types of polishers uh, throughout all of my uh, clinical cases. So it's whatever you're comfortable with. And I, I don't really feel there's one that's better than another. I certainly have been partial to, to discs for a long time, but you can't always do that on the, in the molar area. So usually I'm using this to trim some of the, uh, the excess margins. And once that's done, uh, occasionally, and sometimes I've got them joined together, other times I've got them separately, whatever works best. And then you can see it, uh, put some uh, of your temporary cement in there, place it in the mouth, uh, have them bite on a cotton roll until it's set, and then uh, and you're done. Now, I'm just going to go back for one second. What do we do in this area? I usually will give the patients, uh, we'll give them a floss threader that they can put underneath, just tell them not to pull it straight up, and that way they can at least clean everything underneath there. Do, does everyone do that? I have no idea. I think I have a few patients that are diligent, and I think a lot of them just don't, but you have to at least inform them of it, and those are the final restorations that are there. Uh, here's another one. Um, we've got a, an alloy here. There's a little fracture, so we'll just patch that up a little bit before I ended up uh, prepping. And we took we did a pre-treatment matrix, and it's in a little metal tray. Now I, I'm not going to go through the preparation guidelines. This is part of a, my case where I'm talking about prep design, and I just grabbed a few slides out of it. But these are two crowns that are being prepped. I, I use uh, depth cutters as well. And once they're prepared and cleaned up, I want to make some my provisional. So we'll take the perfect temp uh, 10 out, uh, place the material right inside the, the areas of the matrix that uh, we want to make the provisionals that have been prepped for the crowns, and we seed it in. This is another type of tray that's available that you can get from some of the manufacturers. And uh, hold it in place and keep it in place for that minute and 30 seconds. I have a timer. Uh, we have, our dollar store is right around the corner, but every one of our rooms has a timer. And whether I'm making an impression, um, I'm leaving a tray in, um, using a provisional, we'll time everything, even with implants. And so uh, implant provisionals or impressions or things like that. So we just don't want to have any room for error, and it doesn't take a lot. Like, People can say, yeah, I'm counting it in my head, but you just if you have five people in your office and you're doing that, I'll guarantee you you're going to be off by at least 10 or 15 seconds between all of them. So you really want to have a timer. What I'll do is I'll remove it from the mouth. Sometimes it'll stay locked in on or just stay on the prep. What I'll do is I'll carefully tease it out. I'll put it back. Personally, I put them back in the, in the actual um, matrix. I, in my hands, I just like to have them in the matrix, let it set for at least another minute, minute and a half, and then I can take it out and play around with it and polish it, and I just find it's more successful. That's just in my hands. It's just from experience. Um, what I'll do is, uh, in this case, I'm trimming some excess with a multi-fluted carbide burr, and then I'm polishing it with an enhanced polisher. Once it's in, I'll try it in. I'll check the occlusion. Once I'm comfortable with all of that, then we'll use some of this. In this case, we're using Temp on Clear and seeding it in, removing the excess with a little uh, micro brush, 
like we're doing here. And then once that's done, we cure it. Make sure you get rid of the temp on clear. It's a wonderful product, but it really tastes bad. If you leave some behind the residue, patients will tell you because they'll come back the next day and say, oh, I got this horrible taste in my mouth. And so you, uh, it works well, but you just got to get rid of it. Uh, and then you've got your provisionals. In this particular case, I ended up doing uh, two separate provisionals. So when they're flossing, they're going to just take the floss downward, but they're not going to pull it through. They're going to pull it, or they're not going to pull it up and down. They're just going to pull it through. And uh, here's another case. This is a pretreatment uh, before we did a, uh, a crown. And uh, add a root canal on it. Uh, fairly big uh, composites. We ended up doing a core. Did the matrix uh, the, to create a matrix with our alginate substitute. When you're placing the tip in here, uh, don't move it all over the place. It's like Place it right in and just extrude and pull out uniformly so you don't incorporate any bubbles. Again, sometimes when you put a void in and then you place the, uh, the matrix in, it doesn't all it doesn't necessarily flow perfectly. And uh, you just want to eliminate any potential um, troubleshooting areas. That's the main thing. We will seat it in. Again, we've got teeth, holding it in place, keeping it secure, not letting it rock. Once we've done that, in this particular case, took the matrix out, the temporary stayed in. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. What I'll do is I'll carefully tease it out make sure there aren't any undercuts, and I typically don't trim it right away. In this particular case, I did, but I actually let it set for about another minute inside the, uh, the provisional. Then I took it out, and in this case, I'm using some crown and bridge scissors. So I'm trimming that, and then I'm taking a disc, and I'm uh, polishing it up. When I seat it in, at least I know everything fits. Of course, I've verified the, uh, the occlusion as well. Hopefully, I have something that'll look decent for everyday dentistry. I'll certainly spend more time working on an anterior provisional, whether that's right or wrong, but just making sure that those aesthetics are just absolutely perfect. Let's talk about veneers. Um, here's a situation. Uh, this particular patient, tooth number seven, and for you Canadians, tooth number 12, has uh, an implant and it actually has a crown uh, on an implant and some old restorations that are uh, discoloring and chipping. They're all composites, and she wanted some veneers. Whenever I'm doing veneers, and I'm not going into great details of preps and prep designs and all of that, and mounting and occlusion, I'm um, just highlighting a few slides. But if anyone's interested in more, you can send me some questions later. Um, what I will always do a diagnostic wax up for more complex and for aesthetic cases. They will also be mounted on an, on an articulator. But we'll use that diagnostic to, to create a, a stent. And uh, I don't typically use a sterile Sharpie on every veneer prep. That was more to uh, just demonstrate how uh, the use of a depth cutter. But I'll use a depth cutter to uh, start my initial depths for in the aesthetic zone, or I mean in the uh, for veneers, and then I'll smooth everything off with a fine diamond. Now, here's another type of matrix. I've shown you ones that are polyvinyl, but this is an actual one of the, what some people call a suck down matrix or a vacuum form matrix, but you can use it not only as a reduction guide to get an idea based on the wax up, if assuming the wax up was approved by the patient and they're happy with the proportions, but it also allows you to fabricate that uh, provisional. Uh, whenever I'm doing veneers or crowns in the anterior zone, I'll take a stump shade uh, so that the lab knows exactly how, uh, how to what you have underneath there. You can actually buy stump shade guides and, and the lab can actually purchase dye material of that particular stump. So when they're making their uh, aesthetic crown, their ceramic crown, they'll be able to uh, match it up closely to what you have in the mouth, which is a, a very nice feature to have. So, as I said before, we have a variety of products that are available to us for, uh, for doing uh, veneer provisionals. Now, how I'll make these veneer provisionals, I, I mean, from a cost point of view and a time point of view, I 
I like to make them myself chair side rather than getting a lab to do it. Um, it's just a lot more expensive uh, doing it that way. And I think I can do a good enough job of making, uh, you know, short to medium term uh, provisionals that look really good in at conversation distance, I like to call it. So uh, that's kind of a, a nice thing to have. So I'll place the material into that stent. I'll seed it in the mouth. Once it's seeded in the mouth, I'll wipe off any of the excess that's on the top. And again, leave it for the initial set time, which is a minute and 30 seconds. Then I'll tease it out. And rather than taking everything out at once, uh, I leave it in place for the next two to three minutes to let it fully set. But while it's happening, I will actually take an instrument and start cleaning off all the flash. In this particular case, it's a T3. And I'm cleaning off as much of the excess flash. Now I can take it out, because now three to four minutes have gone by. It's stable. There's not any expansion. And I can start trimming it even more. Once I've done that, I'll go in and I'll actually clean the tooth off. Now, this is a shrink wrap technique that I learned from one of my mentors. He's a prosthodontist down in the States. And uh, he's published it. I've actually done an article on it as well. But I'm basically, what I'm doing is I'm cleaning the preparations. You can use whatever uh, you'd like to do. In this case, I'm using Tulacid because Concepsis wasn't available to us in Canada. And uh, you can use a mild sodium hypochlorite as well. But I'm rinsing everything off afterwards. Now I'm placing some bond, not a universal adhesive, but just a fourth generation bond. No phosphoric acid, okay? No phosphoric acid, so I'm not etching. I'm placing the same bond inside my provisionals, and then I'm placing a, a suitable shaded flowable in there as my quote-unquote cement. Now I'm seeding it in the mouth and letting everything, all the flowable flow through the embrasures. As that happens, I'm then taking a light and I am light curing it from the lingual. Now, since it's not a, the teeth aren't a bonded surface, the material will actually cure towards the light and it'll lock the provisionals in through the, through the interproximal. Now, with the perfect temp, you can actually now take uh, a composite uh, flowable and actually repair it if you want to, so that's great. Once it's done, if you have a good matrix, there's not a lot of finishing to do. And then in conversation distance, it looks pretty nice. So if a person's standing two to three feet away, you may not know that they have provisionals, which is, which is a really good thing. Here's another example. This is, uh, this is another patient that uh, we have some uh, veneer provisionals. And uh, she's got... Uh, bonded veneers that she had done by a previous dentist probably about 10 years earlier. It was a little over 10 years earlier. Just didn't like the discoloration. And so here's another template that you can use. You can use silicone as well. But you have to make this outside the mouth because silicone is addition cured. So if you put it in the mouth, it actually generates heat. It can be uncomfortable. But I usually will have a couple of templates available for every patient. Um, another little trick is... I'll sometimes take my vacuum form, cut little slots in there, and I can actually measure my depth reduction on, uh, on these veneers, which is kind of an interesting thing. Sometimes that helps. Um, finish my preparations. Once the preps are done, uh, I'll take a stump shade. Don't put the shade tabs on top of the teeth. Put it at the same plane, because when the light's shining on it, you want to get a photograph of that together. So I, I have this picture in there, but I don't put them on top of the teeth, I leave them like I showed you in the previous case. And I, I'll seat this, and I'm going to show you the importance of having a good wax up and a good stent or a matrix. Because if you don't have a nice wax up, you may not have the details that you want and the embrasures won't be as defined. Now what do you do? It looks like a piece of chewing gum that the person's actually put on the outside of their teeth. So what you need to do here is take either the end of a disc or what I ideally like is that multi-fluted carbide burr and I'll just score in the embrasures and just gently with light pressure and water go down here and actually create separation of these embrasures. And once I've done that I can polish that up with a disc 
and then hopefully you have some provisionals that actually look like they belong, like they're nice and separate, and they look like separate teeth. That's what you want to create for the patient during that uh, during that stage. Okay, and then these are the final restorations. Tissue management, the benefits of having a nice provisional. I'm going to show you a couple of implant cases now. These are two implant cases that we're going to talk about. And the benefits of using a provisional and a, a well-fabricated provisional. So in this particular case, it's more of a complex interdisciplinary case because the patient was an adult, close to 60, going through orthodontics as well as an implant placement. So the implant was actually placed. This was quite a while ago. A flap was actually raised. Nowadays, they might not even do that. It was a one-piece implant. But once that implant was placed and the button was prepped, um, a provisional was made, uh, a, a BIS GMA provisional. Now, once that's placed in there, if you have it polished properly, uh, when it initially went in, there was you know, some trauma from that reflection of the flap. But if it's really polished properly, what you're going to find is you're going to have the tissue heal really well. And you'll start seeing that it actually, the tissue is looking really nice. It's, it's looking nice and pink. And that's what you want. And you can only create that if you have a really nice, well-fitted, well-polished provisional. Okay, This was a longer period of time. But when you look at this here, even on the palatal, it looks really nice. When you take the provisional off, you're going to actually see that there's no bleeding. The tissue is nicely reflected. You can actually see that now it's doing crown and bridge. We're basically going to make an impression. And when we do that, the lab can make you a crown that's going to fit well, and it's going to look like a tooth. Now, yes, you can tell that it's ceramic, but you may not be able to tell that it's actually a dental implant or if it's an actual lateral incisor. And so the tissue is very nice. That's several years afterwards. It's a four and a half years after. Now, here's another uh, example. Oh, a spelling error, too. This particular patient had a tooth that was uh, knocked out due to trauma. The uh, surgeon basically took the tooth out, ended up grafting the site, and then placing an implant later after the after the socket preservation. Uh, maintained bone in the interproximal, but had several surgeries that were done. So now we have a situation where we want to shape the tissue, the implants uncovered, and now we need to make a provisional. So the provisional is made, it's a BIS GMA provisional on a temporary abutment, make it outside the mouth, so the lab fabricated it with a, uh, with a BIS GMA material that I had provided them. And they under-contoured it right now. They didn't create the full contour because right after you uh, uncover and place this provisional on there, <clears throat> excuse me, you've got a situation where you want the tissue to mature. And it's going to take a while. You've got to go through that healing process. So right now, you're going to leave it so that it's a bit under-contoured in this area and let the tissue come down and fill in. As time goes on it, and it starts filling in, what you're going to now do is bring the patient back every two to three weeks and actually take the provisional out and start shaping it properly, adding some composite in the different areas and starting to now shape the tissue and push it away because the healing's now uh, underway and, and, and the, that area is going to fill in. And it's only going to fill in if you have bone in the right spot underneath there. And again, there's lots of literature to support that. And if you don't have bone, tissue's not going to follow. As you start, as we're starting to get through, you can see now it's starting to take shape. The tissue's filling in. I'm able to start building up this provisional to allow it to, uh, to kind of shape that tissue. And again, if I didn't have a nice, smooth provisional, it's not going to work. Okay? It's absolutely not going to work. Here are the final stages. As you can see now, the abutment's in place. The tissue is looking nice. There's a little bit of redness around here, but it actually is very healthy. It's a very healthy tissue, and you can see the stippling around here. That's important. That's why having a really nice, well-fabricated provisional is, is what's key. It's very, very important. Okay. And once we get to the final stages, now the, we'll make it. What I'll do, I'm going to go back one sec. Right here, I'll take 
once we're happy with the shape and everything, what I'll do is I'll make a copy of this. I'll, I'll take a photograph and I'll make an impression of this. And the lab now has that and they know what shape that final crown should be. And they can reproduce that. Now with scanners, you can actually scan that and then, and then just copy the scan and design it um, virtually as well. So that's a nice thing. So afterwards, you want a, a final restoration that looks exactly like that. So you pop that off, you, the temporary, you put this one on there, and you either screw it in or you cement it, depending on the, on the situation, and it should fit in like a glove, and the tissue should be just as healthy because we had a really nice provision through that whole stage. Okay, And these BIS GMAs, like perfect tenth, just it works out perfectly that way. So what are some of the, the highlights? Except, oh, I've got a couple of spelling errors. I apologize for that. Uh, I have an extra T on the end of that. Um, Cost-wise, the product actually is less expensive than some of its competitors right now, which is a, which is a nice thing for those that uh, where, where it is important. Uh, but in my opinion, the, the more important things are the points that come after it. It's got great aesthetics. It's got really good strength and durability. I've already used some where I've had multiple units. If I'm having three or four Pontics, no matter what it is, I'm actually reinforcing it. It's either with a wire or fiber or something like that. But if I've, if I have no problems doing, you know, a three-unit bridge or a six or seven-unit bridge, if I've just got one Pontic uh, in different sections, uh, it's not a problem. And posterior, I'm very happy, uh, happy with it. Uh, the oxygen inhibited layer is very minimal, so it allows me to add to it and finish it really well. And, and the shades have been uh, perfect for, for most of the anterior uh, aesthetics that I've been looking for. Final bullet points. Uh, what are the keys to, uh, to making simple and predictable temporaries? Well, first of all, please make sure you have a diagnostic wax up if it's required, especially for anterior zone for aesthetics, uh, for an anterior bridge, I will have a, a, a diagnostic wax up. At the very minimum after that, a matrix or a stamp. You want accurate dimensions of the tooth and teeth that are involved uh, so that you, you actually have created um, you know, proper well-fitting temporaries where things aren't shifting and the teeth are stable. So that's really important. You want a material that's convenient and easy to use, something that you can add to very easily, something that you can finish, uh, handle well, it's not sticky, not tacky. That's why Perfect Temp 10 works really well in my hands and my assistants. They've noticed the difference since we've been using it. Um, you want something that, fi that finishes and polishes with minimal steps. I mean, they take time. And if they break or chip or uh, you have to redo them in any way, um, you want to have something that doesn't take you like 10 steps and sometimes you know only two or three steps and maybe you don't even need to polish because you've left it in for the right amount of time and you've had a wonderful great um, diagnostic wax up in a matrix something that's easy to cement as well uh, would be nice uh, most of them are for that matter and of course aesthetics something that really looks nice our patients that's probably one of the biggest things. They just don't want them to break. They don't want sensitivity, and they want it to look good. So those are uh, those are key things. And that takes care of my uh, lecture portion of the webinar. Uh, my email address is here. I am available for those that have any questions right now. And if you have any questions afterwards, please feel free to uh, to email me. I'd be happy to try and answer anything for you. I am accessible, and uh, my work phone number is on there as well, and my website. It says drpshaw.com. That is one website. My other one now is actually drpareshshaw, P-A-R-E-S-H.com. And, uh, yeah, I'm here for a few more minutes if you have any questions. Uh, and if you don't, uh, that's fine as well. So I'll wait. Wait for those, if there are any. I'm not sure where uh, where everyone's from, so uh, might have people from different. Uh, what is the matrix material you use? Um, as I had mentioned before, 
the matrix material that I'm using is a, a usually it's an al alginate alternative that I use. It's a polyvinyl, so I'll use. There's one called alginot. There's another one called alginex. Alginex. Uh, I don't know how you spell. I think it's spelled like this. I just spelled it in there. And uh, it's a good product. Uh, certainly a little more expensive than the uh, alginate, but uh, you know I use it even for some uh, diagnostic impressions and things like that because I can do multiple pours if I need to. Questions. So, well, listen. If there aren't any other questions, if there are, after uh, once again, uh, you've uh, got my uh, got my email address. And you certainly can fire me a, a quick email. And uh, you can also send it through the Catapult site, just like you're, you're on here today. And that's my website. So um, thank you very much for all your time.